Welcome to the world premiere of the new film by Alice Winokur, Proxima. My name is Cameron Bailey. I am the artistic director and the co-head here at TIFF. I'm so glad to see you all here to see a full house for the uh, world premiere of this film uh, that we saw several weeks ago and I fell in love with rather instantly. And uh, we wanted to have this film to present to you and I'm so glad that we're able to do it and that you're here. To begin, we want to acknowledge where we are. This is the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the uh, traditional uh, territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and Huron-Wendat. They have been on this land and taking care of this land for thousands of years, and we're grateful to be here and to share uh, the land in this community. Uh, this film is eligible for two prizes, the Platform Prize, which is juried, and the Grolsch People's Choice Award, which is voted on by you. So please remember to vote. You can go online to tiff.net slash vote and vote for your favorite films there. Big thanks to Pathé International for providing us with this film, and thank you always to uh, Unifrance for their support of all of the French films at the festival. Alice Winocourt was born in Paris. She graduated from the legendary film school Les Femis and has uh, directed a number of short films and two feature films which both played at this festival, Augustine in 2012 and Disorder in 2015. This is her latest film. And after we watched the film, the team at TIFF, after we saw it and we were talking about it and we were talking about it and we, were, we had so many things, so many thoughts that came to mind, but one thing that I was thinking of was if there was a filmmaker by the name of Alice Guy Blachet, who was one of the pioneers of cinema in the late 1800s and was right at the very beginning of film history into the early part of the 20th century. And one of the things I thought was that if, his, if the history of film had taken a different course and had followed, say, the course that Alice Guy Blachet had set and many other women had begun working at the center of film after her, and the story you're about to see would not be so uncommon. It might be familiar. There might be whole genres based on the kind of film that you're about to see, but it didn't, and it's not so familiar, and that's one of the things that makes this film so remarkable. It's a story that we should be used to seeing in the movies all the time, but we almost never do, and that it's told with such beauty, such grace, such dramatic heart uh, makes it all the stronger, and makes the need for this kind of film all the stronger. And, and I was just so glad to see it. Uh, and I hope that there'll, there'll be many more films like it to come, and certainly many more films from Elise. She is a terrific filmmaker. And if this is your first time discovering her work, you are in for a treat. She's here to introduce the film to you this evening. Please join me in welcoming the director of Proxima, Elise Winokur. Super happy and very, very excited to be here tonight to present Proxima's for a world premiere. And uh, <laughs> it's like it's like the day uh, of lunch. <laughs> and um, I really wanted to thank you. It was a, a very long prep and uh, a long shooting. And uh, I really wanted to thank the selection committee and Cameron Bailey uh, to have this opportunity. Uh, to, to show the film for the first time here in Toronto. And uh, Proxima has been shot in real places uh, where astronauts uh, are training from all over the world. And uh, this is also where they are leaving the planets. Uh, so um, when I made this choice, I think <laughs> my pr it was not um, in the... the the best choice maybe for my producers. <laughs> and uh, so we traveled from Cologne to Star City near Moscow and Baikonur where there are the real launch of rockets. Um, so I really need to thank so much like um, uh, all the, the, the team uh, that were like uh, working so hard on the ground to make this possible. And uh, so my producers, Isabelle Madeleine and Emily Tisney, 
uh, my distributors, uh, Adavan, Safai, and Jérôme Sedou, and all of the team, and uh, my agent, um, Christina Batsekis, and Bart Walker. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yes, and uh, so I wish you a very good screening. And um, yes, I, I have to thank someone in particular, uh, Eva Green. Um, she has trained so hard and um, she um, really was devoted to the film and uh, uh, to, to, to make this journey on my side. So I'm uh, very, I'm thrilled. And uh, she's going to say a few words because she's, uh, she's uh, not there. <laughs> and um, I wish you a very good screen. And there is a QA and a in the end. And uh, I hope you will be there too. Uh, I will be there. <laughs> okay. So I wanted to start by asking uh, what inspired you to explore um, this story of motherhood within a world of astronauts. Uh, yeah, I think that um, since I'm a kid, um, I, I've been fascinated by space, but it was like more a kind of a abstract, an, an, a poet, poetical attraction. <laughs> and uh, then I, I, I did some research uh, on, on this world for this film, and I discovered this world, and I thought it was uh, the more I visited places, the more I, 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 I met people, the more I realized that all of those uh, years of preparation, all of those efforts of uh, astronauts to leave the Earth, it was something that was almost never shown in films. And uh, in real life, astronauts spend most of their life uh, in preparation. And sometimes they never leave. Uh, so that was the idea. And then uh, uh, I like to discover like a uh, world. And then I realized that uh, what drives me to it was something really intimate. And, um, and I think it's the only way for me to talk about my intimacy is to project me in very distant and unknown worlds. And here I wanted to talk about, um, you know, this uh, complex relationship between a mother and a daughter that I uh, know really well because I have my, a daughter myself who is 10. And, um, and so it was really about um, this question of separation and uh, how to deal with it and this feeling of guilt, how to overcome. And, um, and also, yes, I thought this... Uh, Astronaut was uh, interesting. Of course, it's a world bigger than life, <laughs> but um, we can relate to it. And also, uh, the astronauts, uh, the stakes of the astronaut of leaving the Earth could re resonate with uh, this idea of leaving the little girl. And then maybe you could talk more about the research that went into it and, and the different places and the access. Yeah. And, um, but I, um, I took a train for Cologne, which is the center of the European Space Agency. And, uh, and <laughs> I arrived there and then uh, uh, I literally spent like, um, I don't know, like two years <laughs> in the European Space Agency. And, uh, and I, I met so many trainers and astronauts and women astronauts. And uh, I had this amazing opportunity to be able to shoot in those real places. And it has never been done that there is no film that we're able to go there because it's really military places. There is checkpoints everywhere. It's really like something um, where astronauts are training and uh, astronauts from all over the world. It's not only Russians, it's not only European. It's because of course, um, we are uh, used to this kind of image of space that is that, um, like the NASA in Houston. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, but those astronauts, the Americans, when it's time to leave the Earth, they are training in Star City as well because the only way to leave Earth, to go to the International Space Station, is from Baikonur in Kazakhstan. And the spacecraft is the Soyuz. And to learn how to... The, the, I mean, the protocols, there is one place, which is Star City. 
So uh, Americans have a bigger pool in Houston, but uh, they have to they have to sleep in those bedrooms that you see in the film. And uh, it's not me who has chosen the sh the sheets of the, <laughs> of the of the bed. It's the real. <laughs> I haven't changed anything. Uh, the centrifuge is like uh, as it is. And um, to me, it was really moving to discover how old it was. And, and yes, this fragility, because um, I think it's the paradox of the astronaut that in films you, sh you see them as superhumans, but uh, it's on the contrary, being an astronaut is an experience you know, of uh, fragility and uh, our fragility and uh, vulnerability. And because our body are made to to live on Earth, you know, <laughs> not on space, and it's really a really hard training, and it's not so easy to to leave the Earth. <laughs> I mean, did you get a chance to meet any of the women that were depicted in the credits? And did, uh, you, did yes. you talk to them about family? Uh, and Julie like? Payette, <laughs> and uh, who is the governor of Canada, and uh, it could have been it, it could have based. Had been, had been based on her life because she actually has, I think, three children and she's separated from her husband and she was astronaut and training. And she told me this funny thing that she said to be an astro um, a mother was the best training to be an astronaut because that's why how she, has, how she had learned multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> so I think... Um, Yes, it's, um, I, I really wanted to show a superheroine and a mother at the same time. I think cinema does not often represent those two states in the same person, um, as if they were incompatible. But um, heroine has, in this kind of world, have, have no children because it would, like, uh, it would be like a diver divert them from their mission. But uh, in real life, uh, women <laughs> have children. <laughs> and most of the time, I mean, even things are changing. They feel responsible and they do most of the job, you know? So I think uh, it was all about this question of uh, <laughs> so the, what they call the mental load. And also about this, uh, um, yes, there's women not, not, not talking about it, you know? Uh, um, trainer in the ESA because I, I, I really wrote with a astrophysician, with trainers, with astronauts and a, a trainer uh, told me that men kept talking about their children during <laughs> the, like showing pictures, like being really proud of being like so good astronauts and at the same time being having children and uh, she had like trained um, a woman astronaut for more than six months. And uh, at the very end, she learned that she had uh, children, but she, no one knew about it. So um, I think, yes, it's, it was about this. Um, the, the film says that um, what it's Madeleine who says, uh, there's no such thing as the perfect mother, but <laughs> you can do both. I mean, you can be a good mother and a good astronaut. And uh, those pictures, it was like family pictures those astronauts have sent me. And um, to, there are many of them. <laughs> and, but they don't, they don't really uh, talk about it. Because uh, again, I mean, uh, this world of space is a metaphor. I mean, it's the same thing in companies and in <laughs> real life. Uh, that um, people know that, uh, women know that having children is considered as a weakness. If uh, you, ha you have children, it means you, for some people, that you are not focused on your job, you, <laughs> that, you, that you are not a professional or that you're going to leave earlier or whatever. So they don't talk about it. Maybe we can take some questions from the audience now, if you just raise your hand, and then I'll repeat the questions just so everyone can hear. And I think we can start very front row here, and then we'll go back. Hi.
And the question was about uh, casting of the women in the lead roles. Uh, yes, so Eva Green, I thought about her because I, I think uh, I, ne I needed someone that was not uh, like a Mata Dolorosa or those kind of mother. I mean, uh, she didn't look like a mother. She's not a mother herself. And she looked like a warrior. <laughs> And uh, I think it was interesting to see her with a little girl and how she was going to do. And, and also, I liked that she has a kind of strangeness and a grace. Uh, and I th think she, you know, she plays in a lot of films, uh, Tim Burton. And I think she is a, a bit like that in real life, that she's a kind of a space person. <laughs> <laughs> she's not on Earth. And that's what I like about her. And that's why I can relate to her. And um, I, the little girl was quite the same. I mean, she was also, she also has a strangeness. She's dyslexic herself. Um, and uh, also I wanted to uh, film, you know, this physical relationship, you know, for, the, for, for example, this scene in the swimming pool, you know, I thought about them. It had like um, the, if they were in a f uh, amniotic fluid, you know, that I wanted to be really um, more, yeah, physical um, um, to, to film it in a, fin in a physical way. And I mean, and the casting all around is just so detailed, I think. There's so many great performances. Sandra, Sandra Hewler, who's a great actor, um, um, all of it, Matt Dillon. Yeah. It's, it's just that, again, I try to be as close as possible as, as it is in real life, because it's always, in the mission, it's always one American, one Russian, and one European astronaut going into the Soyuz. As you see, it's not very, <laughs> there's no, <laughs> no room for <laughs> a lot of astronauts, but you're like this and very, and um, so I have cast an American actor, and an American, uh, Russian, and, uh, and German, and also the, the husband has to be German because uh, uh, Cologne is in, I mean, where there is a European space agency is in Germany. And so it was really, uh, it was great to work with all of those actors because they come from very different culture, but also different type of acting, like Matt Dillon coming from cinema and uh, Lars Edinger coming from like German theater, like Schobune. I had seen him in the Ostermeyer um, um, theater, and uh, Sandra Hula comes also from the Schobune. And uh, Anton, uh, he, I casted him in Moscow, but he, he comes also from the Russian theater, uh, which is different from <laughs> the German theater. And so it was so exciting like to have all this type of performances. And we felt really like a astronauts together, like because astronauts are really living together, like a different, like um, they, they are all like uh, from different worlds, but, at the, but they work together for to go to the station, and so that's what also, the film itself was a kind of mission to us. But it's funny because they still have to sleep on different floors. <laughs> okay, I think there's another question right here. The question was about the mixture of humor within the film. Yes, because I think it's part also of uh, life, like to uh, make jokes, especially, you know, when we can, we, I call it the re resilience humor, <laughs> humor, you know, when it's really hard. The straining, you know, are really hard, very, very hard for the body, you know. Um, uh, space is not a place for. <laughs> For for human, you know, you what, what it says in the the say in the film is true that your 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 body grows from three to four inches. That's huge, and it's really it hurts. And then you 
you, your, your vision weakens, then you, you, your cells grow older, you lose your sense of balance. I mean, it's really a violence to the body. And uh, there is all this biopsy. I mean, all of those things, that was great to me because it was like as if the documentary was meeting my own obsession of cinema, of filming like this, the body, uh, like, um, women as a guinea pig, like this trapped and, <laughs> and all of those things and um, in machines. And But um, yeah, I mean, because it's very hard. It's like on the set, you know, on the shooting, like we have to make jokes all the time, like to entertain when it's not easy, like just... And also because it's uh, we have fun and they have fun too because it's uh, yeah it's like um, and then you know when I was writing the character of Lars you know the the father I wrote it with an astrophysician uh, La, um, Maurice Sylvestre Maurice he has designed the camera on the Curiosity rover and uh, <laughs> so he was when I was calling him. Uh, he was telling me, you can call me very late tonight because I'm on Mars. <laughs> and I was like, are, we, are you on Mars really? And he was saying, yes, because I'm exploring with curiosity. You know, I'm discovering Mars. So, And so there, those people, they are really a little nuts, you know, crazy. <laughs> And uh, you know the two the two watches the father have. It's one is a real watch that Sylvester is wearing with the the hour on Mars. So um, I, that's why I could connect to those people, and I think there are really a relation between the world of cinema and the world of those astronauts because we are not in the real world. We are like um, like experiencing like. Um, like, in, yes, we are working very hard. I mean, uh, and um, also there is those crews like Mission Control. Um, I mean, all of those people working to make it happen because we only know the astronauts, but behind them. But I met so many astronauts, like in Kazakhstan. I was there for a real lounge and I met Chris Cassidy, the head of the NASA. He was just there like, <laughs> just reading a book in the middle of nowhere, and we had this nice chat. And I asked him, do you want to play in the film? And uh, he said no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know he was the head of the NASA. <laughs> <laughs> and then he told uh, the French astronaut Thomas Pesquet, there is a crazy French girl who came to ask me to play in a movie. <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one more question right here. He was asking about the um, the sequence at the end where she takes her daughter to uh, see the space sh the spaceship. What is the question? Well, he wants to know about the choice of, of her getting out of the the quarantine and going to the ah, yes. to show. So yes, this of I thought it was beautiful that uh, to see that at the point she's ready to forget her dream and to I mean to to go to fulfill her promise to her daughter. And, um, and uh, but it's, I, I wrote it and it comes from my, my imagination, but then I met another astronaut and she told me um, that she had done this in real life, <laughs> that she had escaped for quarantine for Halloween because she wanted to, go to make trick, uh, trick or treats with her daughter. And she had said that they, and she wanted to do like only two or three house just to. <laughs> and so, and there is another astronaut, uh, Jean-Francois Clairvoy, a French astronaut who told me it's not very funny, but it's, uh, it happens also that he escaped also from quarantine with the help of his doctor because uh, his son, uh, had uh, cancer and uh, and uh, he decided to leave but he wanted to, to just to say less goodbye 
Because also you never know. I mean, the, all the letters, all that stuff you see in the film, you know, it's real. I mean, you have to write a letter to your, to your children to, if you don't come back, it's, a, it's possible. And um, so, and seeing, you know, a real lounge, you know, in Baikonur is really an exper incredible experience that you really see like someone going like in the sky and out of the atmosphere and it's like in a way dying, you know? And, um, and at the same time, it's so like uh, exhilarating. You feel like a children and we feel like a old children and, and you know, you can be Japanese, American. I mean, there is a kind of a cooperation and that's what is beautiful in this field of them. And also, uh, I wanted the film to be like a celebration of the Earth more than a space movie because uh, it's when w the paradoxical situation is that when you are about to leave Earth, you realize how you are connected to the to the Earth, like things you don't pay attention to, like uh, the smell of trees, the, <laughs> the sound of the birds, uh, all of that stuff that I so important that, that astronauts are missing up there. And this, the, um, you know, it's something that Sakamoto, you know, the musician uh, had noticed, he was really moved by um, this idea that the, <laughs> the Russian would uh, record the sounds of nature uh, before going to the station. That's, uh, again, something that uh, Story Musgrave, an, an astronaut, uh, told me. And uh, so Sakamoto is doing this, <laughs> like sound reco um, nature recording. But um, it's all of that stuff that you realize that we are made to live on Earth. And uh, space is like... <laughs> and to me, I mean, I had always this in mind, this idea to confront like uh, the infinitely big and the infinitely small. I mean, it was really my obsession uh, writing the scripts and staging, like the endlessness of space and the, the intimacy of the family, like really tiny details of the, of the mother and daughter relationship. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time and can't take any more questions, but I'd really love to thank Alice for bringing this film. <laughs>